was uh, sitting in my apartment in Newton, Massachusetts in 1968, and I had this urge to look at the beginning of Genesis in Hebrew, which was a strange urge considering the fact that I didn't read Hebrew, although I did know the alphabet. Now, I have one talent in this world, and that is I'm a visual pattern recognizer, as maybe has become evident already. <laughs> um, and my eyes fell on the letters. And I could not get it out of my head that there was something peculiar about the sequence of letters. It just didn't look like language to me. Since I couldn't read it, that was a further reason why it didn't look like language. <laughs> um, if it had looked like language, if I had been a good student in my earlier days and had learned to read Hebrew, I would have, just like you pick up a piece of paper in any language, you don't start counting letters and look at letter patterns. You simply read what's said there. And I never would have seen this. I never learned to read Hebrew, but I did learn to read the alphabet. And my one talent in life is that I'm, I'm a visual pattern recognizer. When I see something visual in front of me that makes a pattern, I spot it very quickly. Now, if I could have read Hebrew, this couldn't have happened. But because I couldn't read the Hebrew words, my eyes fell on the letters. Now, you know, if you hold up a newspaper and you can read the words, you never look at the letters. It would be very difficult to do. But I looked at the letters, and all of the bells and whistles in my brain went off. All those pattern-recognizing alarms went off and said there is something most unusual, something peculiar about this sequence of letters. So I asked around, assuming that Genesis was the most heavily researched document going, and people told me they didn't know what I was talking about. I asked a rabbi, I asked a priest, I went over to MIT, I went over to Harvard, I, nothing. Eventually, people told me this must be Kabbalah, it must be Hebrew mysticism. <coughs> I'd never heard of Kabbalah, um, so I decided I'd better get educated if I was going to figure out what was going on here. And I realized that if no one knew about this, and there really was some kind of coding in the letters of the text of Genesis, then this could be very important. So, I spent from 1968 until 1978, when we moved to San Francisco, collecting and reading just about every text in English that I could find that was on mystical traditions. Now, I read Kabbalistic material, Hebrew tradition. I read Christian and Muslim. I read Hindu and Buddhist and Taoist and, and ancient um, civilizations of all kinds. I read Greek metaphysics, all translations in English, but a very wide gamut. I read things that were even written by people who claimed to be up and flying sources. I was completely indiscriminate. And I started to put together a sense that even though I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. It was very nice poetry, and yes, there might very well be meditations involved. Um, the literary criticism methods that the academic scholars used to make sense of Kabbalistic texts didn't do much for me. Yes, I could see you could compare this sentence to that sentence, but that didn't tell me anything about what the author was saying. It just told me he was saying the same thing here as here. And eventually, after 10 years, I started to build up a sense that these Kabbalistic texts were talking about something. There was just too many details for it to be pulled out of the air. There was just too much commonality to be, to be the, these texts to be the individual experiences of, of, of mystics. There was, there was something that bound it all together. And it didn't matter if I was reading Rosicrucian material or reading Sanskrit material in English translation um, or, or Hebrew material. It, it all seemed to have the same underpinning. And many others have claimed this, too. There are numerous teachers over the centuries who claim the same thing. Um, but I wasn't satisfied by them simply telling me it was all the same. It didn't look the same. It just felt the same. So the idea was to find out what was going on. Over those years, over the 10 years, I had realized that if there was a pattern in the text, and if I was going to show it to somebody else, that I had to follow the scientific method. People had claimed for centuries that these texts were special. This is a sacred text. But being able to show that to skeptical, technical, modern minds like the people I was associating with was very difficult. So I had drawn up a set of criteria, a set of scientific tests of, of kind of postulates that I expected to be checked off one by one. I did not want to do what many people do and go and make guesses and get ahead of myself or go fishing because that would short-circuit the scientific method. It was absolutely essential that I make a plan, and I stick to it, and I unfold it step by step, just as good science has done. And it finally dawned on me that the first verse of Genesis had a string of 27 letters 
followed by the 27th letter. It's 28 letters altogether. 27 letters, the 27th letter, and a 27 letter alphabet that comes along with it. Three statements of 27. And 27 is three cubed. I said to myself, gee, I wonder what would happen if I counted the letters out in base three by threes. Well, I ultimately tried other bases also, but when I counted by threes, interesting things started to happen. You know, if you look for 20 years, and you're reasonably clever, you're going to find patterns. There's no big deal to finding patterns. The question isn't whether you can find patterns. The question is whether they have any meaning. If you introduce an idea, and it has nothing to do with what you're doing, you won't get any new information out by using that idea. When I shine the light of base 3 on the text, all of a sudden, I start to get patterns. The only thing you can tell about this pattern is, one, it certainly isn't a coincidence. And in fact, um, researchers at UCLA and at bar -Ilan University in Israel and at Technion in, in Haifa, Israel, have done statistical tests on the text. They hadn't done it when I first did this, but they have now. And there's no question that there's letter-level coding throughout the five books of Moses. When I use base 3 to count out the letters, the whole first verse becomes one unit. There aren't any letters left over. Everything has its place. A rabbinic teaching. And the teaching is that the Torah is eternal. The Torah is unique. It's not just a bunch of stories. It's not like anything else, not even like anything else sacred in Judaism, such as the Talmud, which is extremely important. The basis of Jewish practice is in the Talmud. But the Torah can't even be compared to the Talmud. That would be sacrilege. Torah is so unique, it can only be compared to itself. So I decided to compare it to itself. It seemed reasonable. How do you compare a text to itself? Well, now, are we back to literary criticism? Should I look at the, the first story in Genesis of, Gen of the creation and the second and compare how they differ? Well, that's already been done. It wasn't very satisfying. And besides, it didn't give me anything new to work with. I'm looking at the letters. So I said, what would happen if I compared the letters to themselves? And that's what I did. You know how you make a paper doll or a paper airplane? Take a piece of paper, and you stick tab A into slot A, and then you put tab B into slot B, and tab C into slot C. You auto-correlate it. You correlate it with itself. Tab A with slot A, tab B with slot B. And the piece of paper folds up, hopefully, into the model it was intended to make. And so I decided to fold up this string of letters in such a way that letters that were the same were going to be next to each other. I wrote the letters out, one each, on a bead, on a bead chain, in the order that they were written in the text. So you could literally hold out the bead chain and read the first verse of Genesis. And then I took the bead chain and curled it up on itself so that the same letters lined up. Now, um, I'm going to hold up the pattern that we got when we associated the letters slot A in tab A, tab B in slot B, etc., just like the paper pattern. And as you can see, all the letters are accounted for. They're all paired up. And if they're not paired with the same letter, like slot A in tab A and slot B in tab B, they are paired with letters that are in symmetrical positions in the alphabet. So there's a very basic, simple rule that enables all the letters of the first verse to be self-connected, just like the tabs and slots. The reason I started it here, rather than on the edge someplace, is because I realized this was on the surface of a donut, which one could pull through. And I didn't want these lines to cross over in funny ways, so I simply rotated it through itself. But if it were on the surface of a donut, then that would all work as one, one unit. And so that's what the first verse of Genesis draws. It draws a kind of donut called a two-torus, a two-dimensional surface on a torus. So we've now identified the first verse of Genesis. It folds itself up into a donut. This is the bagel theory of reality. <laughs> you just peel the seven color map off of the donut and you have a little vortex. This is the def definition of the donut. You don't need the rest of the donut. Mathematicians don't need the dough. They just want to know what the surface is, you know, how it all fits together. Don't. And what we found, and this is really 
quite startling is when we simplified it mathematically, we ended up producing a form that looked just like this. And this is the form we actually made. This is a minimal geometric way to represent the way the first verse of Genesis forms itself when its letters are paired up, just like making a paper model. Now, you'll probably notice, particularly if you know something of, of Jewish tradition and teaching, that this looks a little like a flame. And the letters are said to come from the flame or from fire. They were written in fire on the original tablets given to Moshe. If you look at this form from different directions, you can see all shadows, two-dimensional outlines of all the Hebrew letters. Uh, we're pretty sure the same form, or some very, very closely related form, produces the Arabic letters. And a related form, but not quite the same, produces the Greek letters. And so we've got the first verse of Genesis folding itself up into a form that when you look at the form from different directions, makes all the letters in which the text is written. Um, and so we have our fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself. And when we look at it from the appropriate directions, for instance, that direction, let me hold it here, it might be easier, we see the Hebrew letter bait. The English equivalent, uh, the English equivalent would be the letter B, the Greek would be beta. This object, this entirely asymmetrical object, which in the past we've identified as a flame, flame of consciousness, Hebrew letters are said to come from flame, Arabic letters are said to come from flame, shadows of, that ob of this object are all of these Hebrew letters. Same one object generates all of these letters of the alphabet. overly impressed. If I had taken a coat hanger and bent it up with a couple of squiggles and played around with my, my shadows, I'd have found all the letters in just about any alphabet. It is not hard to find shadows of a squiggly form that look like letters. It's hard to find an explicit meaningful form that does that. And so it's the fact that that's a meaningful form that counts, not just that you can make shadowgrams that make letters. We've also discovered, even more startlingly, that this is not just a flame representing the flame of consciousness, but it's also a model hand representing our self-awareness. It's our hand that designates us as special in the animal world. It's our opposable thumb that is associated with our ability to make and use language and to make and use tools. It is from the word for hand in Latin, manus, that we are called humans. And further, it's from the region of our mind that controls our hand that we derive the regions that control our speech. And there is another point that needs to be added. Not only in Hebrew tradition is it taught that the letters are made of fire or flame, but they are also said to come from Yod. And that is taken to mean the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Yud, which is the component that makes up all the letter shapes. But Yud also means hand, this hand. And when you look at this form from various different positions, you see all of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. When you make different gestures with your own hands, you see different outlines, different shadows of the same model. 
In fact, you can see all the Hebrew letters. And you know what? Each Hebrew letter has a name. And the name of the letter Pei, the letter Pei, its name means mouth. And you see it when you make this gesture. That's the Hebrew letter Pei. Now you'll see it in my left hand, I'll see it in my right hand. So it's a symmetrical set. Um, this gesture produces the letter Zion. Anybody want to guess what Zion means? How about project? That's not a big secret. The human hand is the human embodiment of a general principle that projects consciousness into physics. And if we look at that general principle of projection from all the possible directions we can look at it, then we can, in theory, take any path possible in consciousness or in physics. So what we're, what we're finding is that there is a general principle that models the way we project our will into the world, which is an analogy for the way if I can say this, God's will is projected into the world through us, that this is a, a cascade of creation, mm -hmm. that we are in the line of this cascade, and that this is a model of it. So that's what we have here. Um, we have a natural, universal gesture language turned into a formal system for recording and playing back meditational exercises which can become the true basis for a science of consciousness which in modern terms becomes a religion um, or several religions actually in fact that's also what this model talks about this is very controversial material because um, in the words of a friendly scholar it can't be so um, and what of course he means is that if it is so then there's a lot of readjustment to make um, and I try to explain to people that this really doesn't say anything like, I'm right and you're all wrong. Um, it says rather that this is a deeper level that integrates a whole range of material. And it demonstrates mostly that what the scholars have been saying and what the religious people have been saying um, and what the different religious people have been saying, they've all been right, but in their own contexts. And that if you go deeper, then you find something more common. Let me, let me say it. I think that if we get this right, if we can figure out what this natural unfoldment is, and we keep track of it in the way that was intended, which is going to be the most compact and economical way, we are going to be able to show that the sequence of letters in the text of Genesis is just as determined as the sequence of digits in the decimal expansion for pi. That is a natural artifact of this universe at the level level. In fact, that quality is very similar to pi. After all, the text, you're not supposed to change a letter to be the destruction of the universe. If you changed any digit in pi, it wouldn't be pi. And I think uh, your use of the mathematical metaphor here is not just an accident. No, not at all, because <laughs> mathematically, we understand the idea of truth as modeling something experimental that we find in the real world. If someone says they have a truth and they use a spiritual sense, we tend to laugh at them. Well, your truth, your truth, whose truth is truth? But if these texts were canonized based on the fact that the sequence of letters was as precise and explicit as the sequence of digits in, say, a universal constant like pi, then we have a whole different understanding of what might have been meant by the various sages of these various traditions claiming they had the truth. Mm -hmm. This is the letter bet, bait. It's the first letter of the text of Genesis. It's the one translated in the. Its formal meaning is house. But God's not a noun, God's a verb. In Hebrew is a real mode language. That means the primary roots are verbs, not nouns. So it's not a house, it's housing. It's what a house does. Most people don't pay any attention to this. But in fact, if you can check the references, I think even David Bohm mentions this in, in the Quantum Reality book, which is so wonderful. Um, a bait represents the distinction between inside and outside. And that's going to turn out to be enormously important. The credo of Judaism, what Abraham is credited with discovering, is the unity of inside and outside. There is a four-letter name and a five-letter name for God. The four-letter name is the transcendent point within. 
The five-letter name is all there is, the panoply, the imminence of the universe. Many people over the centuries have had meditational experiences, have come upon that one point of light, that meditational, that transcendental point within. And people for centuries have worshipped idols and gods of all kinds. And everyone knows, or at least most people in this room know, that if you do your affirmations, even if it's to a pagan golden calf or something, you're going to get what you want because the process of affirmation causes manifestation. The key to this teaching on which the Abrahamic faiths are based, on which the Brahmic faiths are based, is that these two manifestations of deity, of divinity, are identical, are unique. That's what Krishna was saying too. That the God within, the point, the meditational point, and the all there is, the planetly of nature in the physical world, the God of immanence, are one, are unity. Inside, outside, and the process of resolving them is also unity. This is the first word of Genesis. Let's look at the first word of Genesis. It's supposed to contain the whole secret. It's supposed to be able to repeat this bait, this basic idea in more detail. So here's the bait, which means in or in the. And then we have this word reishis, which is said to mean at the head of, because the word reish means head. Well, there's another root in here, which is not usually discussed, and that's this root, reshet. Reshet is a woven net or a network. And I'm going to say that the reason the academic statisticians have found letters skip patterns in the Hebrew Bible is because it's a woven document like a Navajo rug with stripes. And if you unravel it, you get skip patterns on the thread because that's what the stripes leave. And I'm going to say that that's the kind of coding that was done in the ancient world and hopefully we'll get to that. Um, that this is a wonderful model of, of everything. By definition, this isn't a jealous God of a petty people who says, my God's bigger and better than your God because it's my God and it's the one God because I say so. That's not what we're saying here. I'm saying we are starting with the definition of singularity and wholeness. Definitions are not the basis of prejudice. It's a postulate. I'm putting it down to see how good it is. It doesn't give us anything. And if we look for the means of spanning between the one and the many, we have a path that includes everything in the universe. Now, modern physics attempts a bottom-up reconstruction. Take all the diversity we find, all the forces in the world, and pump the energy up until things merge together, and eventually we can extrapolate and find the Big Bang, the one from the many. And I'm saying we can do this abstractly. We can do this topologically in principle without any electron microscopes and cyclotrons and supercomputers. We can start top down by definition, start with a singularity, break it up by minimal first distinction, and end up with all there is. And it's my guess, and this is still a guess, that one way or another, in an extraordinarily elegant way, perhaps the most elegant possible, that's what the sequence of letters in the Hebrew Bible really represents. We look at religion, if we look at history as static, then we've got a fossilized structure that's not alive. But if we look at a living tradition, it's just like a living thing. A tree doesn't look the same during all phases of its life. Sometimes it looks like an acorn, sometimes it looks like a tree, sometimes it looks like leaves and branches, sometimes it's all desiccated. Um, sometimes the new fruit has to fall on the ground and decay. The current phase of the Jewish cycle is to be a vessel. The rabbis have created this incredibly coherent vessel that survived thousands of years of persecution and has continued to carry the Torah intact and in principle the light in that Torah, the meditation, the science of consciousness in that Torah through the centuries. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't, one doesn't mistake the vessel for the light inside. Um, one doesn't ex mistake a librarian for a person who has command of the knowledge in the encyclopedia. Those are two different functions. The rabbis in our modern times have been brilliant at community building, at maintaining a, a community that can maintain the Torah and maintain its own integrity and keep the Sabbath. And in fact, that's why I'm honoring that tradition, because if it weren't for people doing that hard work, um, this well would have dried up. Mm -hmm. And I am doing research that's benefiting from the sweet water this tradition has preserved. So I have to honor that. 
And I think that's a, that's a, a very valid way to respond to a traditional teachings. Um, we have a vessel. In order to get into the vessel, you have to respect the vessel, you have to be part of it, and then it can open. Mm -hmm. And then what's inside is worth even more. Demonstrating to the scientific community that traditional material handed down over thousands of years is valid today will provide great respect for the traditional material. And demonstrating to observant people, to religiously intense people, that what they've been protecting and carrying all these years is now respected in the world will enable them to open to the world a little more and be somewhat less defensive. Now, I'm generalizing. I don't mean this is some sort of panacea. But this is part of a legitimate bridge between various seemingly opposite elements in our society, whether it's between science and religion, whether it's between the secular world and the observant world. These same models also generate other sacred alphabets that came later. The Greek alphabet, the Arabic alphabet, are also generated by the same form that the beginning of the text of Genesis draws for us. And so we ought to be able to show that some of these other traditions have a connection at this mathematical level, at this consciousness level, and that thereby traditions can respect each other. Now, this isn't a matter of making everybody's religion the same. Far from it. Those are totally different embodiments we approach from different directions. But the basis, the common element in our consciousness, in our hands, literally, is what we have. And it's the alphabet. And I think that's very beautiful.